a very warm welcome to everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to IEL's InnovLog event organized by the Center for Innovation and Development and InLab. Right. This is in partnership with Griffith University and Skills Future Singapore. And today we are discussing the very on-trend topic of work and learning, the new normal. I'm Renee, and I'm from the Center for Innovation and Development, IEL. And we have with us today three very distinguished panelists to lead us through um, today's dialogue. Okay, so let me introduce our three panelists first and then we will get into the heart of the matter, okay? Firstly, beaming in all the way from Brisbane, Australia, Professor Stephen Billard, who is Professor of Adult and Vocational Education at Griffith University. Okay, Professor Stephen Billard is uh, a National Teaching Fellow and Australian Research Council Future Fellow. He has an extremely fascinating career history and um, his two recent uh, honorary appointments include being honorary research fellow at Oxford University uh, last year, and he will be awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Geneva in October 2020. Next, we have Mr. Go Di Long, who is owner and managing director of Xi'an Tech Engineering Private Limited which is Asia's leading marine company, um, which looks after life cycle management of equipment on board ships and looks after as well, the learning and development of marine engineers. Uh, Mr. Go is very, into, very much into innovation and together with his innovation partners, we're very proud to announce that Mr. Go was one of our winners uh, of the InnoPlus Award held here at InLab. And in view of the COVID-19 pandemic, he's been working on digitalizing all parts of the business uh, in order to go fully online. Finally, we have Mr. Yong Wee Chiang, who is CEO of Parkway College, part of the Parkway Pantai Limited Group. Okay, Mr. Yong has also an extremely illustrious career thus far, and as CEO of uh, Parkway College, he leads the training arm of the Singapore op Operations in the IHH group. Um, he focuses, therefore, on strengthening operational systems within the company through knowledge management initiatives, and he champions people development efforts, especially in leadership training and development. So you can see that this is going to be a really exciting time with um, an academic and industry practitioners, two leaders in industry who will be taking us through today's topic, okay? So um, the format of today's session will be that each speaker will um, give us an initial take on their views on the topic, and thereafter we will start taking questions, okay? So perhaps Professor Billet, you'd like to start? Professor Billet, please. Okay, everybody, um, welcome to the seminar, and I hope you can hear me and see the slides clearly. And it's great to have this opportunity to engage with you. I just want to provide some ov overview, initial comments to, to commence the proceedings. And what's, sorry, I am having difficulty. Yep, okay. It's not going on to the next slide, sorry. Um, I might have to go back and to bring the other slide in. So what I want to do is just take you through some opening comments. 
Now, the, the first one is really the context in which we're working. And that is, you may recall in 2010, the Economic Review Committee, which is an economic committee, um, made the point that for Singapore to maintain its prosperity and the quality of its lifestyle for people, that the first priority would be that Singaporeans would have to need to continue to learn across working life to sustain their employability and contributions to the economy. I mean, this is a fairly, this was a fairly strong statement, an unusual statement for a, an economic focus. And within that, the idea is that workplaces, places where people engage in work and could be quite central to this learning and that work activities and everyday work activities and interactions and guidance in the workplace are going to be important. Many countries are facing the same issue. And a common feature is the realization that you cannot um, churn entire workforces through education institutions, educational programs. So we need to find practical and engaging ways for developing people's skills across working life, but also that workplaces provide a whole set of learning experiences which are rich and pertinent to and very accessible developing people's skills. And in about 2015, Singapore participated in the, the, the program for the International Assessment of uh, Adult Competence. And what that study found, which has now been undertaken by over 35 um, countries, is that the findings were that, that Singaporean workers were highly educated, were good at problem solving and engaged in lots of learning in their work. However, there was also notice that compared with other countries, that Singaporean workers were seen to lack some of the discretion, some of the ability to contribute to the workplace that were found in other countries. And this led to the MOM in 2016, urging employers to provide opportunities for um, employees to engage in the workplace to, uh, to assist in innovation and change. So the important points here, and which I think are gonna be echoed in the, the next two speakers is that workplace innovation and learning come together that the need for workers to engage in new in problem solving to respond to the kind of issues being presented by the covid virus and also to learn through that seems to be important for achieving um, governmental goals uh, workplace goals and personal goals about uh, sustaining employability across working life so wh what are the challenges well and what are the impacts of COVID-19 um, and their implications for learning in the workplace? I think these differ enormously across workers. For some workers, the work, for, the work requirements have become simply more intense. So this is the case with many healthcare workers, security workers, police. So they're dealing with new tasks and new problems. For other workers, um, including people like myself, and I'm sure many of the audience here, um, there's a requirement for different ways of working, from working for, from home, for using new technology, engaging in different ways, and using different kinds of procedures that um, were previously the case. Then for some uh, workers, there's been a significant transformation in the actual work they're doing. So many restaurants, I know in Singapore, as well as places like Australia, there's been transformation from restaurants serving food in-house to actually having takeaway businesses. Then, for instance, in healthcare, we're moving to using telehealth so that doctors don't actually physically engage with patients, but engage with them through, through um, electronic technology. So these kind of changes bring about new procedures, the ability to perform those, different ways of engaging, and also the different kinds of the distribution of work tasks as work is done differently. Then, unfortunately, for many workers, their work has been extinguished. Um, events organizers, flight crews, pilots, etc. they found that their work has simply evaporated. So these workers then need to find and transit to new occupations and employment. So how do these play out in terms of, of the workplace? Well, the implications for um, each of these classifications of changes are slightly different, I think. That for workers dealing with greater intensity, there can be guidance in the workplace, debriefings after critical incidents, using incidents in the workplace to support people's learning for sharing and innovating practice. For those who are learning different ways of working, new ways of working, there's guidance is required and opportunities for developing those skills through interacting 
and using technologies and engaging in different kinds of support. Then for those whose work has been transformed, there's the need to develop and enact new procedures, new ways of doing things and new concepts, new understanding. You know, what does customer service mean for takeaway food as, a pro, uh, as, a, as opposed to um, um, offering it in, in a restaurant? What does the healthcare mean when it's done through a computer, et cetera? So these are new approaches and also this has often has impact across work teams. So for instance, I've got a project now which is looking at um, how general practice has changed because of general medical practice changed because of COVID. And the work of the receptionists in medical centers has changed enormously as they try to manage patients and triage patients in different ways than, than previously. And then for those workers who have had their work displaced or extinguished, we need to look forward to, to models such as adult apprenticeship models, RPL, aligning what with what they know with their existing skills with the kinds of work that's available and guiding the development of new cap capacities and engaging people working with others who are more experienced to support their learning and sequencing their learning through arrangements in the workplace where they progress through to develop expertise. Um, so how will the workplace learning change and how will workers come to navigate these changes? Four things, I guess. Firstly, close guidance. That is when somebody is directly close to you and assisting you is perhaps going to be more likely mediated by electro electronic technology in the future. But now we have this kind of technology where we have images, so much more is possible than when previously we didn't have this kind of technology, when you can share screens, when you can show images, et cetera. And also the importance of, of indirect guidance, of being guided by somebody at a distance, and perhaps workers needing to be more independent, more engaged in independent problem solving. So rather than simply saying, oh, I don't know how to do this, but try and work through some of the FAQs and the procedures which are available in so many places to assist um, developing these skills, to use tools and engagements um, with, with other workers. And this requires workers to become, um, the term is agentic, and that is more proactive, more engaged perhaps in their the, the, the thinking and acting. And also to use the kind of interactions we're having now for meetings or co-working arrangements as opportunities for learning. We know that many of the kind of meetings we have are great opportunities for sharing experiences, for understanding different perspectives and being able to monitor and enact changes, all of which is associated with learning and it's, it, it can be quite rich. I do work in healthcare, for instance, where we look at the way that nurses handovers and doctors handovers are very rich ways in which novices can learn about patients' conditions and how the patient is being treated and managed and the outcomes of all of that. Now, these are very, very rich learning experiences, although they're part of everyday work activities. And then it's the importance of realizing that innovation and learning co-occur. So as you do new things, you learn, and to do new things, you need to learn. And in a project um, work, working through colleagues in IEL, and in looking at five SMEs engaged in um, innovation in the workplace, we found that it was the very close circumstances of, of, that allowed this to happen. It was the way that co-workers worked with others, supervisors permitted workers to initiate um, and, and enact innovations and then sustain them over time. Okay, and then finally, um, so I think, this situation, bad though it is, provides a whole range of opportunities for workplace learning as workplaces respond to unforeseen um, challenges and involving employees in processes that can be productive uh, for, for work and learning uh, to co-occur. So going back to the, the study I'm doing in general practice, the idea is to look at the entire general practice and to see the way that that the, the, the requirements of, of COVID-19 is a dress rehearsal for how um, general practice, medical practice might occur in the future. And we've got to remember that these changes involve conceptual changes, conceptual knowledge, knowing, procedural knowledge, how we do things, and dispositional knowledge, 
the kind of valuing that we have. And each of these has to be realized, but each of these forms of knowledge requires particular approaches to generate them. Lots of dispositions, for instance, arise from observ observing people and, and performing tasks and making judgments about its worth and otherwise. Uh, understanding comes from particular, particular means by which you can understand something and then procedural knowledge ar arise from actually doing things to learn how to achieve goals. But they can be quite distinct. And I guess, you know, an, an ideal is for Singaporean workplaces to become learning practices where learning is a, an inherent part of, of everyday work activities. One time I was staying at the uh, MBS and before the breakfast service started, all of the staff were gathered around the person in charge of the breakfast service and they were going through the dishes and things. And that was really bringing people up to date, bringing the workers, making them aware of the requirements for work. So a strong focus on learning through, through everyday work activities. And also, um, and this might sound slightly controversial, but many Singaporean workers that I've interviewed describe themselves as rank and file. And that is not their job to innovate, and sometimes maybe not their job to learn. But I think we need to put that aside and realize that all workers have the capacity to learn and innovate, and that needs to be encouraged and to fully utilize um, uh, employees' capacities. So I think I will finish there and um, on to the next uh, speaker. Thank you, Professor Billet. We've got a lot to think through there. And now we're going to invite Mr. Godi Long from Xiantec Engineering Private Limited to present his point of view. Mr. Go, please. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, give me a second. Let me get my slides up. Can you see the slides? Okay. Okay, um, uh, good afternoon uh, to, every board, uh, to everyone. I think uh, everyone is uh, most likely at home. So uh, thank you very much for the chance to share. I'm, uh, my job here is to actually share learnings, uh, the, the perspective of learning from, uh, from the angle of uh, SMEs. Uh, so I will start now. What I'll be covering is uh, what we have done in the past, uh, how, how COVID has affected us right now in currently, and also what is the future things that uh, uh, our company is doing in terms of learning. Okay, just a quick introduction so that uh, later on uh, everything will fall into perspective. Uh, we are a 19-year-old company based in Singapore. Uh, our job basically uh, mainly is that if you ride your bicycle down in uh, East Coast Road, if you look out to the sea, there's lots of ships over there. So my company is that is that one of those companies that will go up onto those ships to do our repairs. So, and the difference is that we are the authorized repair center for many of the equipments on board the ship. Um, we are, also, uh, except for Singapore, we are also based in Croatia. We have an office over there, and we also have an office in uh, China. Okay, so in the past, as I'm, um, what has happened for us itself is that, uh, as I mentioned just now, one of the key things uh, is that because we are so-called, so, uh, so like the Bonio Motors of Toyota, or the cycle and carriage for Mercedes, we are the guys who are uh, who represent the equipment makers of uh, uh, machines on ships. Uh, so when these ships have an issue in Singapore, uh, my guys are the guys who are authorized by the, the makers to go and do repairs. So that sounds like a great thing, but it also gives us a lot of things to worry about. So why we do learning and development? Why do we do, do L&D and uh, is that we are being forced to upgrade our competency because we are the official service reps of this equipment. We, when we go out onto the ship, we can't give an excuse, say, oh, we don't know how to do this and sorry, you're on your own. We have to make the equipment that we are responsible of to work and to run. Okay, and uh, our company started in 2001 with only one engineer and that one engineer is my father. So, and uh, we quickly learned that uh, the best engineer is not necessarily the best teacher. Okay, learning and uh, teaching and doing is uh, very different and I'm quite sure that applies to any uh, other SME, whether you are FMB or even a shop. So what we did at that time was that uh, back in 2011, we started an uh, initiative. We actually started a private limited called GIA Methods. And GIA Methods is our focus on doing training and development of engineers. 
So at the time we have a small studio in our web, uh, in our workshop, and we produce uh, training videos. We even send teams uh, of our, our of our own to uh, to places like Poland, to Norway, to Denmark to film uh, little uh, shots to fo uh, to form contents for our YouTube channel. We also look at a uh, learning management system that you can see on uh, the internet. So we, we, we've done all those things since 2011. So in uh, 2017, uh, like what Renee mentioned, we were very uh, pleased and uh, privileged to be part of the Inno Plus program. And that was a big step for us. Uh, except for doing what at the time we call bite-sized learning to put things into small little pieces for uh, uh, learners to consume easier. We also formed something very important to us called the information or the uh, knowledge architecture, which, are, which we are using uh, even up to today. Uh, through that and for the last uh, few years and especially for the last few months, we are now developing systems and apps to aggregate knowledge, which I'll talk to you a little more about. And we are writing contents, we are developing, we also develop collaborations in the marine sector with our partners in Norway, in Denmark, and uh, also in other countries to form, uh, to start to, we are, we lobby very hard here in the, in locally for SMEs, but also in the marine sector to get everybody to believe in this uh, whole journey about L&D. Okay, so current. Um, so my uh, overall summary for everyone is COVID-19 sucks, okay, and I just have to say it, I, Hope everybody is over 18. I'm sorry, that's the only vulgar thing I will say. So this is uh, last week. These are the ships uh, out there in the sea uh, around the world. Every little dot you see, it's a ship. Okay, and uh, this many of these ships, are, uh, we are responsible for it. We have to uh, take care of these ships when their equipment goes down. So what did COVID-19 do for Marine and for us? It's a number one, we can no longer reach our customers outside Singapore. My engineers from Singapore, because we have the be our beautiful Changi Airport with four terminals, right? We fly from, we do, we service ships in Singapore. We also go as far as Rotterdam to Turkey, to, to Malaysia, uh, to, uh, to Korea, to, to service ships. But now there's no flights. Our service revenue dropped more than 20% since uh, March, which is not funny for all the bosses here. You understand what I'm talking about. The ships themselves, they are, they are having trouble. And this is where knowledge becomes something that uh, uh, becomes the thing that everybody now thinks about. Because ships all along, uh, the crew, the people who works on the ships, the technical crew, they, are, they always only have a surface level knowledge about how to service equipment on board. So, and now with the fact that nobody can leave or board the ship, they are on their own. They can't solve problems. Some of these people who are on the ships, they have been sailing on that ship. Uh, instead of every one month, they get to fly back to see their kids and their your friends say they are now on board the ship for the last four months or so. And for us, uh, it is also difficult, except for not being able to reach the ship. Uh, backwards, I, with myself and the equipment makers, I cannot send my people also to training. We constantly have to send our people to training in even to European countries, we can't do that. And nobody can come to Singapore to do those training also. So the, the ability to do classroom training or face-to-face -face training is no longer there suddenly. Internally, um, of course, on, on the non-engineering side, uh, my administrative team, we work from home. And so all forms of training, even for the accountant to the, to the bookkeeper itself, uh, all that kinds of training is gone. Uh, we can't do any kind of uh, help, monitoring and everything. So it's really not easy for, for us. So what we have done so far is that uh, quickly, we like uh, everyone else, we move to online meetings. We use Google Meet for the pure reason because it's free. Okay, and uh, we, uh, every department start to have their meetings, have, have uh, certain structures, we pen down things to basically meet more. And one of the things that we do uh, that I thought there was a very good practice is that we insist everybody turn on their camera. So uh, that we believe actually makes uh, everything actually uh, very much better. We uh, also did a lot of online uh, collaboration platform. So we have actually used uh, G Suite, uh, uh, which is a Google Suite, uh, share documents and everything for quite some time. We have been a user of monday.com for quite, uh, quite uh, for a year plus already. Uh, so, and because of COVID, we have now been uh, the new happy users of uh, HubSpot. Uh, and under development, that means uh, those three are basically what we use and we buy other people's platform to use. Under development, we are developing our own dashboard. We use uh, Data Studio from uh, 
Google and we develop our own matrix to be able to see our uh, things better uh, offline. We are also developing um, uh, two apps of our own uh, called Gotrix and uh, Arial that uh, is uh, doing nothing but knowledge capturing. And we also uh, have uh, kickstarted something called teleconsultation for ships. In terms of the futures, I think that's um, uh, COVID-19 weather for, it's not just about the dollar and cents for SMEs. I think for uh, SMEs in terms of knowledge, there's a lot of challenges that uh, for SME we need to look at. For companies, especially for Singapore, which is a very, very expensive place itself, all of us need to lower our costs, especially to do anything that is uh, regional or global. And lowering costs means that uh, you have to lower your people. Okay, and, and because people cost is one of the highest for any SMEs. We need to have per output. It, it sounds uh, horrible, but the point is that in order to survive, if your ships sink, then nobody on board uh, can survive. So we need to have more output per employee. And this is where training is very important. And the only way to be more competitive in a very bad em environment is to be competitive is not, uh, uh, is to, to have good people. Uh, a lot of SMEs I, I know because I come from a very, very small one to, uh, to a still small but okay one, is that uh, we think that, oh, the boss, I work very hard, that's enough. No, it's not enough. You, your people need to be as competitive or as knowledgeable as you. Okay, and uh, so for existing employees, it is very important for more employees because you don't see them. If you have an overseas uh, uh, outfit in maybe Hong Kong or Malaysia, you can't see them. And also now they work from home. You need your people to be able to do, uh, take charge more. Number two, you also need them to do more things. So this will need you to have actually some sort of L&D in place. For new employees, of course, you need to train them, you need to monitor them. You cannot wait for COVID to be uh, over, then you start employing people. There will be people that you employ and their first day, first month and first year of work may be all at home. So this is something that you have to be able to do. Okay, and, and you must, one of the things that I, we uh, sometimes talk a lot about is about a new age employee. The employee of today is very, very different from the employee of yesterday. The, the new employee today, they have very low attention span. You, uh, one day of uh, lessons is too much for them. They will rather look at uh, Facebook. And number two, they hate classrooms training. There are different kinds of approaches that's needed to be able to train that guy or that lady who's in the office today. Uh, this is uh, one of my last, uh, last slide itself. Uh, so my, the, the approach to training, I believe for SMEs is like that. To train, you need to have the organization knowledge first. Okay, and for um, a lot of SMEs, you, uh, this seems to be a very big thing, but this is very necessary. We need to write down your SOP. You need to develop that first. Many bosses writing down their SOPs and their staff uh, uh, as laborious, uh, as uh, very hard to do. But I have two things to, to say. Number one, there's many tools around today that is available for any SME to easily and for free be able to digitalize your knowledge. Number two, for SMEs who tell me that this is something that they don't have to do, I say, I'll tell you that SMEs uh, 500 years ago has already done this. They wrote this, what we call the, uh, the, the Kung Fu manuals, it's out of Uling Miji. So this is something that any uh, any companies need to be doing and has been already been doing. So no excuses uh, uh, to the, all the, the other SME bosses. Okay, the big step for SMEs on learning is, uh, I think the main challenge, challenge for us is to get our people to accept and understanding, to understand learning. Uh, well, our environment is very different from MNC. When people come to SME, their mindset may not be uh, directly and immediately uh, suitable for uh, for training, and this is where we need to work a little on it. Okay, the three steps that I think we have that we can do the active passive approach with SME training, I think is number one, to understand your need, know your resources and understand why your organization needs training. Okay, number two, to get government help. Don't try to develop everything by yourself. Get some type of templates, uh, some resources from, um, from Renee. So Rene, uh, please help us. Okay, and uh, use those uh, templates to actually develop your, your, your learning journey. And number three, to stay on the course and achieve quick wins. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Go. Very raw and very ground up type perspective.
Um, very nice. And yes, uh, do come and see Renee <laughs> for resources. Um, yes, so thank you. And now we'll take a look from the perspective of uh, a larger setup, uh, a very large setup actually. And Mr. Yong Wei Chiang, who is um, VP at IHH Healthcare, Berhad, and CEO of Parkway College here in Singapore, will take us through um, his organization's perspective. Mr. Yong, please, thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, my job in the company IHH uh, is uh, knowledge management, and one part of the knowledge management work is really about uh, training, uh, employee training to improve the competency and uh, operational effectiveness uh, of our healthcare uh, organization. So some of you may not know what is IHH, so just a very quick brief. Uh, in Singapore, uh, uh, we own the brands of um, Mao E Hospital, Granigal Hospital, and a Parkway uh, Hospital. In Malaysia, we own the whole chain of a Pantai Hospital and Granigo Hospital. So we have uh, 16 hospitals in Malaysia. And uh, we have our Granigo Hospital in uh, India, in Hong Kong, in China. Uh, and we also have our uh, Achipadam brand in Turkey, right? Uh, they are scattered in the, in the Middle East uh, uh, European countries. So uh, as a group, IHH, we have about 55,000 uh, employees uh, spread across uh, Asia primarily. Um, and we are a relatively young uh, multinational company. Uh, it's only about 10 years old, coming to 10 years old. So um, my work is really to uh, leverage on this vast amount of knowledge that exists in each of our hospital and try to bring uh, all the knowledge together so that as a group, we can benefit from the collective uh, know-how uh, and wisdom of uh, caring for patients. So today I'm going to share uh, only three key points uh, about what we have discovered in this uh, realm of uh, in the past six months or so. Uh, next slide, please. So literally, because of COVID-19, uh, some of you may have got it from a social media that uh, nowadays the greatest digital transformation officer is called COVID. It's not chief information officer or chief technology officer, but it's this guy called COVID. Uh, it is a no choice situation and moreover, this is global. So not only in Singapore, but our, our colleagues in Malaysia, uh, in China, in Hong Kong, in Turkey, we are all similarly affected that we have to work from home. Uh, so other than the company have to scramble uh, a little bit to make sure that everybody get connected uh, while working from home, uh, the IT team has been busy to make sure that uh, the VPN are set up, set up uh, and the machines are all ready. Uh, information access are uh, made uh, available uh, and literally we then realized that we can work from home and not only just work from home for our local offices we can also collaborate across the different geography something that we already know but COVID-19 allow us or uh, kind of force us to really do it do it for real so for example in even in Parkway College we have to very quickly uh, within a week switch all our academic courses, our diploma and nursing, our radiography courses to be all conducted online. So uh, the, the team of teachers have to quickly revise the curriculum because now uh, a one hour lesson online is not the same as a one hour lesson in the classroom. We realize that the, the, the gauge is probably about 75 to 80, uh, 75 to 80 percent of the classroom can be conducted online. And the entire uh, uh, approach of teaching the same lesson has to be revised. Now teachers have to give out materials in advance, uh, expect them to have studied and attempt some of the quizzes, and then come to, come to the virtual classroom. Uh, they have to focus on uh, uh, in 
interaction interactive activity where the teacher is uh, the student and the student need to learn some things because of them. Uh, we have teachers who were uh, they, they, she left us uh, and went back to UK and then she got stuck in UK for uh, for four, four months. She could not come back. And then she was just teaching all the classes from London and the student didn't miss a bit because it was the same uh, regardless of whether the teacher is in Singapore or is in London. And likewise, when we collaborate across uh, the company, our nurses from the different region come together and uh, have webinar. Uh, to talk about patient safety, uh, managing patient uh, uh, safety and managing uh, uh, infection control uh, protocol uh, in this uh, uh, COVID-19 situation. So they learn to use uh, Microsoft Teams live events. Uh, they never had to learn that, but they exercise own initiative to learn it. They organize, self-organize it and then they try out small group experiment and then they conducted basically a, a cross geography international uh, webinar for our nurses and now it's becoming a monthly feature among the nurses right so the, a, a clear shared mission is important uh, a clear outcome of wanting to do something that is useful that is valuable to everybody is important and none of this uh, work from home or dispersion uh, can stop our people from wanting to do good and finally, is this whole idea of it's important to have a common frame to understand uh, what is the uh, roles and responsibility of everyone uh, in doing the work. There must be a clear task and coordination and everyone in the team needs to be uh, very certain uh, and demonstrated the competency of delivering value to the team. Right? So, uh, a plan well communicated in a dispersed team can still get a lot of things done. So one of the things that uh, our company also uh, uh, introduced during this period is teleconsultation, for example. Our Indian, uh, in the, our hospital in India, uh, the first to start uh, teleconsultation uh, because uh, it's crowded everywhere, uh, people stay at home. So, um, they are quite happy that they are able to speak to a doctor. Get sometime only wanted to get a second opinion, uh, and still pay almost the same fees, uh, for the consultation. And when they make the decision to come to the hospital, then they're going to have the so-called fiscal uh, patient care uh, at the hospital itself, right? Uh, so things are evolving uh, during this time, but uh, we have learned that we want to focus on creating the value. So it has the same clear, clear sense of a purpose and clear defined objective and everybody learn how to work together as a team. Okay, next slide. I actually, Professor uh, Billet is the guru here. This is really just my personal uh, understanding that why I think that uh, working and learning and workplace learning is so important. In fact, uh, since I started work, uh, I started work in the military. So uh, the key thing about uh, military is all about leading people uh, into a dangerous mission. Why would people want to want to go into that kind of environment? So the key thing is all about leading people. So leadership is important, and leadership is not a qualification. Leadership is actually a practice. You can learn all the theory that you want, but you have to practice it on the ground, and. As I grow in my working career and as I work, then we understand that work is really just about creating value. If our work creates something that somebody else's want, then the work is of good value. And uh, creating value for the different type of situation, for the different perspective, for the different possibility, for a different outcome, those are the real work, right? Sometimes the value that's created is suitable for just one, sometimes it's suitable for the masses. So in the medical field, for example, every patient is slightly different, even though they may have the same uh, symptom, the same illness, but they are slightly different because every human being is slightly different. Every condition is slightly different. And in, in things like in people business, uh, in the position that where I am right now and 
we are talking about uh, management, we are talking about uh, uh, leadership, then this is the whole idea that you can be, you can be working together with the same team, same people. And this same team may have worked very well in the previous uh, scenario uh, last month, last year. But in a new environment, in a new scenario, the team may no longer work very well because there are some changes that's going on in everybody's life. The scenario is not the same as the last time. And the exact solution that was used for the last time may not work this time around. So working is important in order to create the value is important to be complemented by learning at the same time. The learning is to understand what is going on, understand the context and uh, understand the nature of things that is now. Uh, so learning is really a, a skill that many of us know. We think that we have learned it from school, but, but today in the workforce, not everybody is intuitive in thinking that they must learn uh, uh, because the situation has changed. So the tendency to try to apply the cookie cutter in every situation that we, we face, especially when doing a people business, is, is going to be uh, uh, not good. It, it can be disastrous. Right. Uh, and we can see that in this uh, COVID-19 situation, when we are all dispersed, uh, this entire value creation become a lot more stuck because uh, everyone needs to be able to join a team and uh, work independently uh, and put it on the table to convince everybody else uh, in the team as to what is the individual value at, why, why is the contribution uh, valuable. And the group needs to come together and learn to discuss why is the solution not so good this time around. So I give an example that uh, in Parkway College, we we introduced a new learning management system just in time. We didn't know that COVID is going to happen. We have started the project since last year, but originally we were thinking that we have more time to uh, scale up the deployment of this learning management system uh, in one place, in one hospital, and then in one country, and then we, we spread to the rest of the world slowly in a year. But we ended up having to do it uh, in a span of uh, two months, right? Uh, so we have a core team who were just as new to the new system, they have to learn very quickly, explore, uh, uh, curate and pick the necessary features and then understanding our own company's uh, context and requirement and start to roll out, uh, design and roll out uh, nuggets of uh, know-how in using the learning management system to the rest of the college. And then uh, have a strategy to train the trainer so that the skill can be, can be scaled up to the larger, uh, uh, the larger group of people uh, dispersed in a different, different location. And we have to do all this thing online uh, because we can't meet. So it's a new experience. It's learning what is going on, what is a new product. It's trying to figure out what works for our organization. It's trying to create a solution uh, to scale up across uh, the organization quickly. And actually, most importantly, is this whole idea of everyone who is involved in the project have a common understanding that this is new. Uh, nobody really knows better. And then some of the things that we're doing is experimental. The smaller group will experiment and then there'll be more... Uh, there, there will be more uh, so-called dead ends that we, we have to overcome. And then we're trying to brace a chill so that we can tell the rest of the big group of uh, our colleagues out there to really smooth sail. And so, so we are able to quickly uh, set up the system uh, and scale it up uh, in two months from just about uh, 2,000 uh, users to uh, close to 20,000 users across a different geography. So this was a new experience for, for, for us, which, which was never thought of in the beginning when we wanted to do this project. And the final slide that I want to talk about is that when dealing with, uh, go to the next slide, please. When we, when we are dealing with people business, really the number one skill, next slide. In my final slide, the next slide, uh, 
I want to talk a little bit about communication. And this is what we realized that really at the end of the day, uh, a lot of the transactional type of uh, work, repetitive or rule-based, we know is already, is already quite uh, well known now that uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, they will take over many of these. So what will human do? We will have to focus on the human business, the human to human interaction. So it's about building relationship. It's about creative uh, activities. So uh, we can, we have experience, for example, online shopping, online application. Uh, this, this is completely new and this is widely accepted all across the world, right? Uh, but for those of us who have uh, done enough online shopping during these uh, few months of uh, work from home, uh, you will also understand that, discover that uh, seller is putting little notes into the packages to surprise you, to please you, uh, in the hope that you will give, give them uh, good uh, feedback, right? Uh, and of course, the product must work in the first place uh, that meet your satisfaction. And, and the good ones are really dealing, uh, collecting the good feedbacks and dealing with the poor feedback uh, in a very public way, uh, in a very proactive way in order to protect our business. So this is quite a different way of uh, uh, doing things right now. And uh, all the seller discovered that they are starting to sell to the, to, to the world because the logistics at the back end is able to support it. But in healthcare business, in learning business, we find that other than, uh, uh, other than those elements that can be e-learning, there's still a requirement for immersive uh, learning. For example, our nurses, our radiographers, they still have to go to the hospital to practice, uh, go through the apprenticeship uh, because it is about uh, interacting and managing every case, every patient. It's slightly different and uh, our nurses, our young nurses, our young radiographer need to build up the kind of uh, experience uh, in managing and caring for patients, right? Um, one of the interesting things that I come across during this period was uh, virtual fine dining. So what happened is that a virtual fine dining is a, a chef, a famous uh, French chef, uh, send, deliver all the uh, pre-prepared food to your house. And then you can organize a party. Everybody is their own house. And on the right time, everybody will turn on, uh, get into the Zoom just like how we're doing a, a webinar right now. But the chef is going to give the instruction as to how do you put all the components together, how do you lay your plates, uh, and how you're supposed to taste the food, and what you should be expecting when you taste the food paired with the wine. And, and so this is a totally new experience. It's innovative, uh, but this is an attempt to try to connect and build a relationship and provide experience uh, even remotely right and of course uh, can work, uh, we can put all the operating theatre nurses together and write a SOP uh, and we can say that it's a SOP for a particular kind of operation and they can put it together even remotely as long as they have a meeting earlier on to talk about the framework right and then uh, distribute the task and then everything put it together and then they can discuss the product uh, online, they don't have to meet together. But it is a different thing if we want to come together and brainstorm a new communication strategy. Uh, how are we going to tell uh, our customer that our hospitals are safe to come? What kind of communication strategy? It is very difficult to do this kind of thing online, right? Uh, in the A and E department, you don't really want to have a doctor that is uh, attending to you in a remote fashion totally uh, isolated from the, from the bus that is happening in the a &E department. So those can't be done. Therefore, communication at work is the means, but it is important for us to realize what we are trying to do and then use the correct kind of a communication mode in order to do our work. And I think this is going to be uh, a very important skills for many of us uh, going forward. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. Yong. Right, I think the three speakers have laid the ground really richly for all of us. And now I'm going to open the floor to um, all our audience. Uh, there are two ways you can um, ask questions. Uh, you can key it into the chat, and I see that some have already started doing so. Okay, or you can raise your hand, uh, and uh, we will try to make time for everyone. Okay, as much as possible. All right, so um, shall we start? I saw a very interesting question. Um, there was a question about um, leadership. Um, yes. Okay, um, could the panelists uh, share their thoughts on how employers, uh, leaders, okay, um, can build a learning culture and mindset within this new normal? Okay, maybe uh, we'll start with uh, Mr. Go. Sorry about uh, culture. Um... Build a learning culture. So make the workers want to learn and um, you know, make it the norm in the, within the organization for learning to take place. There is another question. Uh, if I can actually um, piece this question with another question that was, there's also somewhere in the uh, Q&A saying that basically right now, given that uh, you know, it's uh, COVID and everybody is fighting fire every day itself, yes. right? Uh, how is it that we are going to do this uh, uh, learning in the environment like this? Learning. I actually think yes. otherwise. Um, yes. For my people to be to accept uh, doing new things, it has been very difficult. Even that time in SaaS, what we did was that we switched from Microsoft Outlook to use Google Suite, which is basically Gmail for those uh, who don't understand. But people screamed their head off. Uh, but uh, why it was in the end uh, possible? Because it was SaaS. Uh, there, was a, there was a crisis that happened. People were worried. Uh, therefore, they are willing to change. I see that COVID right now and also in terms of giving culture, cultures are very hard to move. Culture is related to something else, which is habits. So uh, people are very hab habitual in what they do. It's hard to, especially when it's uh, co corporate uh, ha habits itself in terms of how they communicate, how they print out something uh, in A4 size, though they are, they are all digitalized. Sometimes it's very hard to change every part of it. But when you get a culture, when you get some big change or crisis like this, this is where you, it, there is an opportunity to change your culture. But I don't, I think for SME, my, uh, my approach will be there's no, no such thing as a uh, learning culture. Our culture is, is whether your culture involves that learning elements. Uh, so that thing is uh, about willingness to learn. And that thing, please don't see development of a culture as successful when everybody, uh, if you have 50 employees, every 50 employees uh, follow that culture. That is not the idea. A culture is a cry. Uh, that you want people to follow and there will be different people following at different levels. Okay, so as leaders, as management, the first two layers at least, you must believe in the culture, understand the why of why you're doing this itself. Then please, the culture should be uh, also encompassing to allow people to get to have time to uh, accept learning as part of their working life. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Yong, is the situation the same at um, um, Parkway that um, you have some difficulty moving some people, but in general, people are spurred by the crisis to take on more learning? I think the, uh, I would say that uh, I don't have statistics to, to, to put a point, so yeah. it's more anecdotal, right? What we can see is that uh, we are seeing more learning activity. Now, a hospital, although private hospital business are also uh, affected uh, a little bit by the COVID-19 situation. I know the public hospital are all very busy. Um, uh, but it is not as if that uh, the employees are all very free right now. Um, but we see, we see there are more learning activity. So I, I know for a fact that uh, a lot of the courses that we put up on our new learning management system, the pickup rate has been quite encouraging, right? 
uh, on top of that, there are, there are staff who will come forward, volunteer to say that, look, I want to build this courseware and uh, so that more people can benefit. Uh, secondly, is that webinar uh, that is being organized. I talked about the nurses uh, uh, coming together to attend webinar. Uh, I, I think they are, they are participating because they now can, can attend from anywhere. They didn't have to go to a place to attend the, the class. Um, uh, many of my uh, colleagues in the admin and support function, they are also attending webinar while working from home. Uh, on their own initiatives because they receive them uh, on their on their computers, right? Uh, and they can do it, okay? <laughs> I'm not sure it's because the boss is not watching them and so they can do uh, many of the things that they like, but uh, the good thing is that I think they come forward and then they share. Uh, sometimes through social media, uh, sometimes it's through uh, the regular huddle and a meeting and then people talk about, look, this is, this is how Apple do their... Uh, communication. Uh, this is how uh, McDonald is uh, rebranding, uh, rather advertising to talk about social distancing. So, so we see those uh, activities. Yeah. Mm, great. Okay, Professor Billet, your views on this yes. idea of yes. learning culture and building it? Yeah, I mean, essentially, people become committed to something if they're successful with it. And if we look across work, any kinds of work, we find that when people are able to uh, learn something so they can do something more effectively, they become committed to it. I, many, many years ago, I used to work in the clothing industry. And I remember the first time that sewing machines were introduced that had needle positioners that automatically the needle went up or down. And this to many of the machinists was a, was, was a huge change because they'd previously been moving the needle bar up and down on the basis of, of, of the clutch. And initially this was a big shock for them. They didn't want to work, et cetera, but they were given the simple um, tasks that are used when you're training a machinist where you, you, you practice on a piece of, of fiber and you develop accuracy. And very soon they began to realize that this would improve their performance. And this would say would be easier on their body and th th they quickly adapted to th those equipment. I think the same with uh, workplace practices that if enterprises are able to see that as they're confronting these changes at the moment, whether it, you know, it's a restaurant now doing takeaways or whether it's um, a, a new process of engaging or a new electronic technology, as long as there's a, a scheme there by which people can actually develop the skills to be successful within it, I think then you'll find the commitment comes through to it. And we do see examples everywhere of the way that people's practices change. In the city I live, a few years ago, we had a massive drought and people started to be very careful about water use. And now there's a sort of a, an attitude to use of water, which is very conservative. And if you, for instance, were to be seen washing your car down with water, you would, people wouldn't, you know, people would say things, they'd say that's inappropriate, just as under the current COVID circumstances, if somebody's seen you coughing without covering their mouth, they would be admonished for, for, for doing something which is wrong. So, so I think there's, and there are ideas, but in terms of practices, if we can find ways that enterprises can see that by encouraging workers to help them solve problems, the workers learn from it, the worker satisfaction arises. And what we know from studies of SMEs, for instance, that have long levity, they've been around for a long time, is that they have an environment in which workers' contributions are valued and they're able to make contributions and they tend to stay in those workplaces for some time. So, of course, it won't work in every circumstance, but success, if people are able to provide experiences that allow them to engage with new technology, new work processes, new ideas, new concepts, and enjoy success within them, those are the things that then they're likely to become, take them to themselves and uh, become part of their practice. And collectively, of course, this then can be seen as being something across an entire workplace once. Hence this concept of, of, the, learning, um, of the learning practice when people, you know, are used to sharing. And you'll find that workplaces or forms of work such as, for instance, the technicians who help us out with our computers, you'll find that those people, they actually share a lot of information all of the time because new challenges are coming up, new viruses, new bugs in, in software. 
and they develop then shared understandings which allow them to be successful. And I think it's those kind of practices that need to be modeled more broadly. Right. Okay, um, I think um, we'll string together a few uh, questions and put it together. Um, there are questions about how we can um, how we can help workers, but perhaps how the, the question could be we thought of as how we as workers can um, actually uh, be motivated to uh, adapt to these changes more readily uh, in the light of employment challenges, in the light of um, threats to uh, the way we are used to working, in the light of um, all the changes that we've had to face um, amidst this um, pandemic, in the light of uh, anxiety and stress, um, and, 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 and businesses shutting, and uh, for some people, you know, uh, feeling that they've reached an age group where learning is particularly difficult, um, for instance. So how can workers take on um, learning in the midst of all these um, challenges? Yes, uh, Mr. Go, would you like to um, start, please? Uh, okay, I, I, I mean, I think uh, what Renee's question is actually more from the um, uh, angle of an individual. Uh, I'd like to base, uh, basically yes. echo something what Stefan actually said, which is very, very important. I mean, in the, um, I think to, uh, I, I'm 40, 44 this year. My, 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 um, my, my father's generations and my grandfather's generations, those two generations were, were very straightforward generations. If you were come out from school as an engineer, you are an engineer. You are a dentist, you are a dentist, you are an uh, administrator, you are an administrator. This is no longer the case. The, in this life, uh, because of technology, because of everything that happens around us, companies, countries, individuals, we, we will need to make um, big changes in our life, uh, in our adulthood. So even for those with children, know for the fact that your children, uh, in their entire career, it is likely for them to switch career. So even if they graduate with uh, account degrees itself, right? There is a very, that is going to be a, it's going to be a sure thing that they will need to switch sometimes entirely to a new career at a, uh, in, entirely when they grow up. So this comes the problem. People like us, people who are 40s and 50s, we are not used to that. Uh, we are not used to learning because we were promised when we are now doing what we do, uh, we will be doing this forever. So the thing is to take it slow. Know that learning is like an exercise, like going down to run for uh, every day. You don't force yourself into it. Don't, it. You need to slowly build up your stamina. Re the ability to read, for example, needs to be built up. Don't expect yourself to read if you go to Kinokuniya and buy 10 books and put it on the table. They, they were just been... Uh, given to Salvation Army during Chinese New Year next year. So read slowly and start to build up, but do it consistently. Take learning as like an exercise, like trying to lose weight or trying to kick a, a nasty habit, something you need to do consistently and your survival depends on it. Great. Mr. Yong, do you agree? Um, I, th I think circumstances will motivate people to, to move. Uh, I do come across uh, people who find it challenging to uh, adapt and learn uh, new things. Uh, very often when company uh, adjust strategy and reorganize, and then when the management co is committed to keep everybody, but uh, there's a requirement for people to take up new roles. And then uh, we sometimes get a uh, uh, response as in, this is, this, is, uh, this is not my cup of tea. So, I, but I think the, the market out there uh, shape uh, the behavior too. So we also, we, I also come across uh, uh, people uh, who are very enthusiastic because they wanted to explore beyond their current uh, job scope. So we have people who move from functional area to functional area, quite willing to try. So, uh, and I think from the company point of view, we have, uh, uh, we have been encouraging our staff to uh, move, uh, especially the more 
uh, uh, energetic ones, right? Those who are more uh, enthusiastic in wanting to contribute in a different manner. And then we provide the opportunity as, as a big company, not only providing opportunity within Singapore, across the different hospital, across the different function, but we also provide opportunity for working uh, in our uh, uh, units outside of Singapore. Right. Stephen, do you have a take on how we as workers can take on the challenges that are facing us? Yes, I mean, a, a lot of it depends upon one's personal disposition and interest. Um, up until recently, I used to spend a lot of time in taxis, <laughs> going to and from airports and things, not anymore. Um, and often in Australia, taxis are um, driven by recent migrants. And one question I ask them is, how did you learn the city? How did you learn to get around? And I get various responses. And remember one, one person who'd only been in the city a short time told me his personal strategy. And that is, he used the GPS to go to the address. And then from the address, he would turn the GPS and find his own way back. So he actually had an active way, an active habit of learning, um, which was important for him. And I think that's a good example. Now, the, and, and the, the issue that's raised it just now, um, and I think it's a very good issue, and that is um, generational issues and, and change and the, the, the extent of the change that people are engaging with. And I think this is where we need to think about the kind of support, forms of support that are most appropriate. A number of years ago, I think it probably about eight years ago, I did a study in Singapore on um, the, the learning of older workers, those aged over 45. That must make me very old, by the way. And um, those um, workers, what they talked about was in the workplace, they wanted to contribute as well as learning from others. They didn't want to be positioned um, as novices, as, as, as incompetence, but they realized there was things that they could um, learn from others. But it was how they were positioned to, so that it maintained their sense of self as older workers, um, but in a way that they could learn from others, but others could learn from their sharing. And the other thing that came through that study is uh, this idea, and I saw it was in one of the questions about you can't teach a, an old dog new tricks. Well, I hope you can, folks. Um, but um, that, that when I was interviewing these people, I'd say to them, oh, have you learned um, in, in things recently? And they said, oh, no, 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 no. I said, what have you done that's different? And they would go for these things that they had been able to do now, which they hadn't been able to do before i.e. learning and you know th th this idea that older workers for instance are no good with technology well it, it simply wasn't borne out in the data that particularly when there's a purpose to use a technology to engage with others to make work life easy to to do something they hadn't been able to do before and as i wander around lots of countries what i see is people of all ages using telephones and interacting with it and it's clearly not something which is prevalent to a younger generation However, having said that, and going back to the important point of learning, is that it's about readiness. And that is as, as exactly what was said, that if the learning gap is too big, because somebody isn't familiar with this latest technology, it's a question of trying to close that gap, to ease them in that, to support that gap. But just the lack of readiness to do something isn't, a, a, you know, a, a personal failing it's just a, a question of providing support so that person can come to to use the most recent technology and be successful with it so a combination i think of a personal disposition of having personal practices which are active and focused and having an environment which respects you as a learner and respects you as a worker and wants to engage with you and being aware of the different readiness, the different levels of learning that different workers will have to go. So in this, go through. Now in this study I'm just about to commence, which is about get, uh, looking with, working with doctors to, to, to use telemedicine. I suspect, I suspect that it's the younger doctors who will be far more comfortable with using that type of technology than the more experienced um, um, doctors who are actually supervising them. So if we can change around relationships so that it's more reciprocal rather than supervisors, you know, working with, work, um, you know, instructing workers, but rather it's a more reciprocal process of learning so that people 
can bring in their contributions and assist others, that might be a very positive way to go and also build um, a learning culture in, in workplaces. Sorry, thank you. We'll have one more question on uh, SMEs, which I think is directed to Mr. Goh. Um, Mr. Nicholas Lim would like to ask um, if um, the high attrition amongst SME, the SME workforce um, actually um, detracts or impacts the investment in training uh, of um, staff because you know the, uh, people tend to use or at least it's perceived that people tend to use SMEs as a training ground and then gravitate to bigger outfits. Um, is, is there a way to minimize such a talent drain uh, from SMEs? Mr. Goh, perhaps you'd like to take this on. After this, we will shift over to um, the subject of virtual learning. Okay, Mr. Goh, please. Um. I mean, um, uh, brain drain itself out of SMEs to um, big companies is something that I agree with Nicholas. I'm very sour about it. <laughs> but it's not a knowledge thing. Um, um, uh, there are many different things. I think right today itself, because of social media, everything itself, uh, you know, everybody uh, is more mobile in nature. They like to, they, 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 are, they are aware of what happens in the big companies. Uh, 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 whether it's true or not, and they, they go there itself. So that's something we have to reckon with. But uh, to answer the question in the uh, context of uh, today's uh, meeting itself is that we must always remember um, one of the things SME bosses always say, uh, and it's totally not true, is that uh, training cost is not a sunk cost. Okay, sunk cost means it's, it's, you throw in, it disappears. Sunk cost is not. Training, the, the best employees are the employees who like to grow. Uh, employees who like to grow likes to be trained. If you have the culture to attract and you have the culture to train, to always uh, disturb them. Training is not having a training culture, like what the others say, it's not about having causes every other day, then you talk. It's about how you run your business, about the learning opportunities. And this is uh, by itself a way to attract the right talents. So have that as part of uh, how you uh, make have knowledge have uh, have uh, IAL come into to your company right to make your company more sexy in that way then you you attract the right talents also. Thank you and and I think that's very much the heart of it right the the opening of opportunities and then the receptivity to those opportunities uh, makes the employer employee relationship I think particularly uh, fulfilling. Um, okay, and next up, we have a whole series of questions on virtual learning that all of you have been taking on um, and uh, I'm sure very enthusiastically, we've been doing it at the IAL as well. Um, and the question um, is, um, have we been, you know, kind of, uh, are, we, are we clear about um, the outcomes of such learning, uh, virtual learning, uh, learning retention, uh, any behavioral changes that differ from, say, face-to-face -face learning? Um, do we have uh, any ideas about how um, this virtual learning space will change uh, our learning habits, perhaps? Um, Mr. Yong, perhaps you'd like to go first? I think the virtual learning space is here to stay. Uh, in fact, I expect that with technology's progression, there will be more choices and a more uh, virtual learning product. So a lot of the learning now, as in our college, our, our internal uh, review was really um, to make full use of the technology now to allow information transfer to be really uh, done as a self-directed manner. That means we share the information. And then uh, the value of the teacher is now uh, a lot more focused. So a lot of it is showing the way. Uh, a lot of it is about assessment. Uh, a lot of it is about facilitating a group activities. Uh, is the kind of face-to-face -face, uh, learning uh, methods that can't be 
done by a machine or just sharing information. So for example, uh, facilitating a group to solve a problem uh, is not something that you can do uh, uh, without the, I mean, uh, independently or without the classroom. It can be done in a virtual environment, but I think it's best done in a physical environment, in an immersive environment. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, um, Stephen, um, do you think um, this whole, you know, um, um, change in our work conditions towards more remote working, um, virtual meetings, um, you know, will it, will it dismantle the engagement levels uh, of um, uh, you know, of 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 colleagues, um, work teams, and therefore you know um, make it more difficult for um, for that type of learning to 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 take to take place. Uh, the opportunities for you know incidental learning at workplaces, etc., to take place. Yes, I mean there is a risk of that, um, but on the other hand. Um, these kind of technologies also up, open up the potential for it to occur more. Um, so it's a, you know, it, it can be, it, it can be obviously any kind of experience, albeit face to face or online or hands on or whatever it is, has strengths and limitations. And, you know, there's a lot that I think can be learnt um, through this technology particularly when um, it is supported by interactions. If it's merely a means of projecting lots of information, I don't think that's going to be terribly helpful. So I think it's the interactive quality, the ability for people to interact, which will be, be, will be the key element. I, I still suspect that um, for, for my generation, I think there's generational issues here, um, is that once you know a person and know something about them, albeit a patient or a student or a co-worker, that kind of interaction then can occur more strongly um, over electronic technology. Um, however, another generation perhaps might, you know, might find that not necessary, that they're used to engaging um, in these formats all of the time. So I think it's a question of identifying those um, areas of learning that can be best be supported by this type of technology, but also being very careful to identify the kinds of knowledge which are less likely to be and doing something about that. Um, and currently, I've, I've got a study with, within Singapore on um, the preferences of C, for CET, continuing education and training. And it's interesting the response that and we interviewed 180 graduates of PSEIs and about their experiences and what their preferences for continuing education. They, they all say, well, sorry, overall, the trend was that the combination of online and face-to-face -face still remains important, that there's lots of things that you can do online and in some sense it's more convenient. However, um, adults, working age adults, still find it helpful to go to the polytechs and meet with each other, learn from each other, and engage with each other. And what they don't want, by the way, is to travel away across town for a three hour session in the evening for some teacher teaching them. They actually want a lot of interaction. So I think it's whether we can use these technologies to allow people to interact, to share. And some of these new, um, you know, even the technology we're using today has the means by which groups can, you can go into subgroups and discuss something and come back into larger groups. So I think there's lots of potential there as long as the basis for people to share, to articulate, to hear others' perspectives and learn from that. The current generation uh, of folks seem to want the face-to-face -face as well as the online. Who knows, um, a younger generation that's more comfortable with this kind of interaction, that might suffice. But at this point in time, certainly the evidence that's coming through from the study from um, Singapore is that a combination of, of, of both is helpful, particularly where people want to explore things. 
Also, were there particular kinds of procedural learning where people are needing to learn very specific procedures that probably at this point in time still requires close interaction with somebody who can demonstrate and monitor your, your progress with those skills. However, I suspect that, that those kind of skills are becoming fewer. They're very important if you're a physiotherapist, but in other forms of work, they're probably becoming less prevalent. I could be wrong though. Um, so I think it's a question of not just, it's not just having this technology, but how these technologies are used, and in particular, the ways in which we can get interaction, not only between the teacher and the students, but amongst the students. And that, that's never going to be more important than when we're dealing with, with adult learners. Yes, so I, I fully agree with uh, Stefan that I think the interactive part, the creative activity, uh, the serendipitous of uh, group activity is what uh, virtual environment uh, is not so good at uh, facilitating. Uh, during this COVID period, uh, we there are many people who start to uh, cook new dishes or bake uh, uh, things by learning from YouTube. So really, this whole culture of learning, uh, we must address uh, the whole mo the, the motivation of uh, wanting to learn something new. I think people can learn, but uh, their motivation to learn for work leaders and uh, uh, properly. Yeah. I I I like to echo what uh, something that actually Stephen just now said itself. I, uh, for me, virtual learning is a uh, very beginning in the in in this uh, days itself. But actually, for knowledge wise, there's uh, generally two types: uh, explicit knowledge, which is something that you can write, like just now, like what. Uh, Yong said, uh, the, that means, uh, let's say, the recipe for food, right? But there's also the explicit, uh, the toxic knowledge, that means how you cook uh, something. Uh, people will generally then just uh, wave it off and say virtual learning cannot teach uh, toxic uh, knowledge or things that you need to have experiential, experiential uh, uh, touch and uh, practical knowledge to touch. But I see actually an opportunity here. That means actually because of the fact that now the uh, virtual learning uh, training actually allows many much more people to learn and also is in a more sit back, uh, more frequent, high frequent thing. A part of uh, taxing knowledge actually can be spread that uh, last time is not no longer possible, such as the sharing of experiences, the, the little uh, deep dive into certain maybe subjects, even if it's not vocational in, uh, in, uh, in uh, nature itself, right? Such discussion actually because of budget learning, because of the high frequency and the easiness of it, actually can allow uh, training to be done in a very deep dive way that uh, we have not explored yet. So I think that it's yet to be seen. Great. Okay, so we have time for just one more round. Um, um, uh, perhaps uh, may I call upon the panelists to leave us with a tip uh, on managing the new normal in work and learning. You know, um, something that you'd like to leave the audience with. Perhaps we'll start with uh, Professor Billet. Uh, thanks, Renee. I think I just want to emphasize what I've been saying throughout and that is engaging um, workers making them feel responsible, um, giving them a role. What we know about innovations is it's not necessarily where they come from, which engages workers, but the workers' ability to actually take the innovation, see how it applies to their work, and, and, and see the way that they can come to work and, and, and learn through it. So I think it's, you know, the, the, the message for me, of course, is about engagement, giving people discretion, giving people responsibilities. Yes, there will be errors, but of course we don't have errors when we're talking about air traffic control or operations of in, in, in hospital situations. That's where we have simulations. But wherever possible, trying to extend the, um, the, the capacities of workers and in doing so, build their sense of self. Moving very much from what I was saying earlier, this, this idea of the workers being rank and file, let's forget that that's something from a very earlier time, that all workers need to be active learners and active innovators in and through their work. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Yong? I was uh, say that going forward, uh, we need to pay a lot more attention in uh, people-to-people -people, uh, skills. 
so communication skill is one aspect of it. Building relationship and building trust is something that is uh, I think much neglected in the past. Uh, we know the big trend, artificial intelligence, automation, robotics, this to really become a part of our life. But uh, building relationship is not something that can be done overnight. Uh, building trust also is not something that can be done overnight. And the people skill, leadership skill, uh, communication skill, also something that can be achieved. So I think everybody, uh, uh, this set of people skills and uh, be prepared to deal with uh, people business uh, going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Go. would you like to round up for us, please? Uh, so, so maybe our uh, since um, statistic, uh, by statistics, seventy five percent of all uh, Singaporeans are employed by SMEs, right? So I shall target my last tips for the SME boss. Um, um, when I talk to my no normal SME bo uh, other bosses, when we have a copy at the copy team, uh, Stephen, that's our cheap cheap version of uh, Starbucks. Um, we, we always uh, laugh at each other before COVID that uh, when we are free, sometimes uh, what we do is that we were, uh, except for doing boss-like boss, uh, boss uh, -like activities, right? We will help to fix the Wi-Fi, go and run to deposit checks, uh, or basically go and buy toilet paper if the pantry is a lack of toilet paper. Um, COVID is here, uh, and even without COVID itself, uh, Singapore is in a position where we are very competitive, it is no, it's not going to be a good idea if we are trying to survive by trying to outbid the guy from Malaysia or Indonesia or somewhere else by prices or by speed or by anything else. They can do it better than you. Singapore, if you want to do it better, it is by using better knowledge, by how you organize knowledge. So I employ everybody, especially boss itself. It's very hard to do it, but start on the journey to, to start learning, uh, to go for many of these uh, causes itself. Then uh, don't, be, um, don't be over worried, don't be over anxious, but start to develop a plan to pivot your business. And part of your plan, I believe very much will involve the technology and the learning L&D uh, in, uh, interventions that we are talking about today. Great, thank you. And on that note, um, we've gone through uh, quite a few uh, topics actually um, here this afternoon. I'd very much like to thank our three panelists, um, Professor Billet, Mr. Go, Mr. Yong, uh, for joining us today and for um, sharing all your um, tips and perspectives and ideas. And to you, our audience, uh, Inlet wishes to thank you. I wish to thank you very much for spending the afternoon with us. Have a good day ahead, good evening, and um, see you again at the next InnovLog or InnovSeries event. Thank you. Goodbye.